Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Protect All Your Applications, a Low-Code Approach, sponsored by Digital, Digital AI. I'm Jenna Sargent, News Editor of SD Times. Before we get started, I have a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. First, this webinar is going to be recorded and available on demand through the sdtimes.com website about 24 hours after the event. Secondly, if at any time you have questions about or during the presentation, you may submit them using the control panel's question tab. Organizations often don't have the app security expertise needed to secure their applications, but new innovations in security are making it easy to incorporate app protection into the DevOps pipeline. In this webinar, Mike Woodward, security product owner at Digital AI, We'll discuss lessons learned from recent security breaches, a tiered approach to identifying essential levels of app protection, a risk-based approach to move from reactive to proactive app protection, and best practices to incorporate app security. Now to get things started, I will throw it, throw it over to you, Mike. Thanks, Jenna, and welcome everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. So as companies are trying to make the challenge or the, the transformation to um, the digital transformations, uh, there are a lot of issues that they have. Uh, and the, the big one right at the top here is the difficulty of controlling costs. Uh, this happens because usually there are um, many different groups that are producing apps these days uh, using different tools, different kinds of teams. You know, you've got professional developers, you've got people who are not really developers who are using a low code or no code approach to creating apps. Um, and so you're getting, you're getting a lot of apps that are doing different things. Uh, and you've got these complex environments and, and it's very hard to, to kind of track what's going on from one group to another. Um, because uh, the, the people with, uh, kind of the deep security backgrounds are a little bit in demand. Uh, they're not always available. They're not always called in uh, as these various teams are building apps. And so they don't necessarily, the apps don't necessarily get the scrutiny that they would have had before when, when a, a company was producing kind of one big flagship app. And so we want to see what we can do about these problems um, after we look at a little bit of uh, the fallout of some of this. In terms of building your apps, uh, here's just a, a little bit. Digital.ai came together from five, di or from five different companies and really want to control or, or give you ability to, um, to use our tools in various parts of your software delivery process. So from um, you know, planning your process, releasing it, uh, doing testing, adding security, um, looking at results and figuring out what you want to do and using um, machine learning, AI, business logic, you can, you can kind of plan and orchestrate the, the building of your apps. And one of the things that we want to do is by looking at where security, in this case, uh, comes into play here to see how that fits and, and how we can make best use of that in, in kind of this overall pipeline. Um, but first, let's, let's see where, where we've come from a little bit. So it, it used to be that if you protected your, uh, your internal network, if you had your firewalls, your intrusion detections, those kinds of things that you were controlling your data center and your internal network, that was good enough. But these days, um, it's not anymore because of the apps that uh, that your organization produces and are out in the field, out in the wild, uh, that those apps need to uh, communicate with your data center. And so all of those nice techniques that you've got for securing that backend data, you have to poke holes in those firewalls for those, uh, for those apps to be able to do their thing in order to uh, authenticate users in order, in order to uh, show users what is available for sale or the status of their account or any of those things, there's got to be this communication back and forth between the app, which exists in the wild in a, in a kind of an uncontrolled environment. And one of the things that I like to, to say is that when you 
uh, give an app to a user, uh, what you're doing is you're giving them uh, a working example of how to use your APIs, how to access that backend data. And that's not a, that's not a very good thing um, unless you do something to protect uh, your apps and your data um, from people who are going to look at that and trying to look for the vulnerabilities. One of the things that, uh, that we ask is, you know, do you know if your app is under attack? And sometimes the answer is, no, I, I don't know, which is kind of the scariest answer uh, because you don't know what's happening there. Uh, another answer that we hear is, well, it, it probably is, which, you know, shows that somebody is maybe thinking a little bit more uh, about the problem or has some more concern about it but still doesn't know uh, exactly what's going on, um, whether they're really being attacked or not, uh, how vigorously, what kind of attacks are being used. And, and we, wanna, we wanna get to the situation where you can say, yeah, I, I know I've got apps out there. They're, you know, they, they're being attacked and they're being attacked in these ways uh, most recently. And you know, I've got another set of mitigations that are gonna go against that. And so, we want to we want to get to to kind of a, a new state where not only is your back end protected but we've got this uh, extended um, perimeter of trust that includes your secured apps so that even though uh, some bad actors may have uh, your apps on their devices those are protected well enough that it makes their job very difficult um, to, you know, to understand your APIs, to get to your backend data, uh, you know, to change the functionality of, of those apps. And we're going to do that by uh, putting different protection primitives uh, right into your app. This app, app, excuse me. So the application kind of self-protect, um, make sure that uh, the apps are running in the environment that you want them to run in. And uh, we're gonna come to this several times. One of the things that is, is critical is being able to monitor what's happening to your apps so that you can uh, understand what's happening and take the next steps. And so if we get to the point, you know, is your app under attack? Yeah, probably is what, what's happening. Uh, here's a chart that just shows what we have seen uh, from our uh, AppAware threat analytics platform uh, from, from Q1 uh, this year. Most of the people using your apps are legitimate users. They're, they're doing fine. Here we saw that 95% um, of your users um, are using them kind of as you would expect them to and as you would hope them to. But there's a little over 5% that we found uh, in, this, in this sample where something is not, is not uh, quite right. Um, in some cases, it's just the, the environment is unsafe. So it could be a jailbroken or a rooted, a rooted phone. Um, and maybe that's okay, maybe it's not. It depends really on what you, uh, what you have in your app and, and what your business model is. Uh, that may not be... Uh, you know, may not be bad in itself. If we take a, a step uh, up though, uh, we saw that, yeah, 0.3% of those apps um, were actually being instrumented. So being run uh, in a debugger, uh, were uh, being attached, uh, you know, and driven by, you know, Frida or something like that. So that people in that case are doing something that you wouldn't expect to try to understand how your app is working. And then the scary thing as we come to the top here, is we found 4% of the apps, these are running app instances, that 4% of those um, were modified in some way so that the integrity of the app has been changed. You know, this doesn't happen by itself. Somebody has gone in with a you know, hex editor, you know, they've decompiled or disassembled your app, they found something they want to change. They've made a change to it, and then they're running it. And so uh, those are those are, you know, easily identifiable as as attacks. 
And certainly, you know, you want to be aware of what's going on here. But when you see something like that, uh, you want to make sure that uh, they're not taking the ne next step from compromising your app to compromising uh, your, your valuable backend data. And this is where, um, you know, that last page showed us uh, what you can see. Uh, here's the situation for most apps, though is that uh, you have an idea for an app, you develop it, um, you know, maybe you protect it to whatever level you think is right, you deploy it, kind of throwing it over the transom, and now um, what's happening to it? In, the, in most cases, uh, organizations don't really know what's happening. They may find out if they send it to a pen tester and a pen tester say, hey, you've got you know, weaknesses here that you need to shore up. Um, it may be that you land on the front page someplace, uh, which is not a good place to be in terms of app security. Uh, and so you might know, oh, we've been attacked, you know, and, and we're being alerted, you know, about it by the news. One of the things, though, that, that happens here is without, um, without any feedback, without closing this loop, uh, you don't know if your app is being protected kind of at the right level. Now you could have a, a throwaway app that doesn't need you know, any protection. You have maybe some, a few uh, flagship apps uh, that you know need strong protection, but there's a bunch of, there are a bunch of apps in the middle usually where maybe they need some, maybe they need more, but, but we don't know because we don't know what's happening. And so uh, we need to have those insights uh, so that we can figure out how to right size the protection because all the protection comes at a price, uh, especially you know, as you get into the stronger protection, that um, it takes uh, more powerful tools, it takes a better understanding of what's going on in the app. Um, there are trade-offs between the performance of the app and, and the protection levels. And so all of that takes time to figure out what to do in terms of protecting an app, and, and it's not free. If, if the app is um, not really under attack or, or under kind of very minor attack, maybe a, a simple level of protection is all that you need. But if you see that something more is happening, then you wanna make that extra investment uh, to, to do the stronger protection. And so this year, uh, digital.ai has rolled out essential app protection. We have had Kind of premium app protection products for a long time uh, to, to take care of that upper tier of apps. But one of the things that we found is that more and more uh, companies have uh, more and more apps. Not all of them are as high value as the ones that we have protected in the past. And so uh, a tool like Essential App Protection um, can give you that first level of protection so that you can. Uh, decide, um, you get some feedback and decide what you want to do. In this case, uh, you've got your, your Android or your iOS apps. And without, uh, without doing any real configuration at all, um, that we can inject a library into your app uh, that itself has some mechanisms in it to detect attacks and to securely link it to your, to your app so that uh, if it detects uh, that you're running in an unsafe environment, uh, you know, there's a debugger, there's Frida, there's, there's um, uh, you know, jailbroken or rooted device, uh, that, that that can be reported. And it uses threat insights um, to, to do that reporting. Um, it can also look to see if the integrity of the app has been changed and also report that so that there are various mechanisms that are put in here um, and then when it's connected to your app so that now when your app runs it can report to our back-end servers that another instance excuse me <coughs> that another instance of your app is running and here's the status it's either running in a good environment or a bad environment um, as as the app runs uh, it can report whether or not any uh, integrity issues are found. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and so this all comes 
uh, kind of a, a very low uh, cost of entry. You just uh, run a script or um, upload your app to our server, have it protected, and then you get a, a version back that, that you're able to run. And then you, you have the threat insights that you can decide um, what to do next. And so what this does is it helps us to really close this loop so that by getting uh, the information back from uh, the threat insights, the threat analytics, as your app is running, that you can understand, is it being attacked? If so, by whom? If so, how? And then you can decide um, what to do to, to, uh, to combat that, if anything. Maybe it's, it's your app, app is being attacked, but it's so low level that it's not bothering you, and you just wanna continue. Um, if it's being attacked more vigorously, um, you may want to, to make um, some changes here. Or if you, if you decide that your app um, is being attacked sufficiently, that the IP involved or the access to the backend data uh, is a big enough threat uh, that you want to move from, from this product up to one of the premium protection products. Um, but the only way that you can make that decision, and like I said before, there's cost involved in terms of the the running of the app because of the performance is going to be um, is going to take more of a, a hit in terms of degradation. Usually not very much, but um, something. I mean, that protection has got to run someplace. So you can decide: Do I want to move up and have stronger protection, or do I not need it? And I'm good enough with just kind of the single click uh, protection that I that I've got here. In terms of the threat insights, um, there, are, there are various things that you can find out. Uh, and if, here again, it's showing uh, jailbreak detections or debugger detections, whether uh, the apps have been modified. Um, you can also connect uh, user information to the events that come back so that you can see uh, what users are um, you know, are attacking your apps or running it in unsafe environments uh, to build up kind of a, a picture of, of who those users are and decide what to do. Um, we've had customers in the, in the gaming industry who do something like this and periodically go through and, and all of these users um, that they find have been, um, have been attacking their apps in a certain way, may get banned. So they can they have the data that they can figure out whether to do that. If you've got a, a banking or financial app, it may be that uh, it's okay for a user to run in an unsafe environment, but you want to have uh, kind of a second level of authentication if that's the case. Um, you want to make sure that uh, that that app is not spoofing another user and so you can ask for uh, you know another form of identification or something like that or you'll need to call your branch you know there's an issue with your account or something like that um, and, and basically any any roadblock that you can put up in front of an attacker um, gives them incentive to go bother somebody else this is this is exactly the situation you hear about in the, the joke you know if you're being chased by a bear you don't need to be faster than the bear, you just need to be faster than your friend, um, you know, because attackers pay attention to, um, to their own ROI, which, which is a little bit uh, funny concept, but it, it does make sense. So if they're trying to hack, you know, a bank account or a bank app, and they pick up one and it's been protected and it's very hard for them to make any progress with it, uh, they're just as likely going to set it down and move on to something else. Now, it'd be great to be in a, a situation where all the banking apps are suitably protected and there's nothing that an attacker can really do. We're not there yet. But again, it's you don't want your name to be on the front page of the paper because of a, of a, a breach, because an attacker was able to, to get at your backend systems uh, through a, an app that was unprotected.
And again, there are, there are different levels of threats from kind of looking at the environment, whether it's safe or unsafe, whether uh, your app is being uh, analyzed, um, you know, with, with a debugger or uh, a, a framework like Frida, whether your app has actually been tampered. And um, using, using our tools or other tools, you can respond to um, these kind of different levels of threats and you can do a, you can respond in different ways. So like I said before, you could ask for more ID, you could, you could force, um, you know, a, a second, you know, form of authentication. Um, you could shut down the app. You could uh, remove some functionality from the app and only let uh, the, the user do certain things if you see, um, you know, instrumentation going on. And if you see, you know, the integrity is, is um, you know, compromised, you could just turn off the app completely. So there are different things that you can do here and, and kind of how you do the protection can either be simple with something like essential app protection or it can be, it can be trickier um, to make it harder for an attacker who may be looking uh, at how your app responds to the things that they're doing harder for them to kind of get cause and effect. And so I've been talking about uh, essential app protection and premium app protection. And here's just a little chart that, um, that, that shows a little bit of the difference. And again, if, you, if you've got a high value app, you may wanna go straight to the kind of the premium app protection because you know that there are, are Hacker communities out there who, you know, want to ruin gameplay or steal money or um, inject malware, uh, so so that there are things that you may want to protect right away. But if you don't know, if you've got an app that is kind of a low code app or a no code app, or you don't know if it's very important, maybe it's an internal only app, app, you can start with essential app protection. And again, that that is kind of the the, the simple uh, way to get started. You can have the threat reporting and insights in, in both cases. And again, that, that helps you kind of close the lap or loop to figure out what you wanna do. Um, this can be integrated in your, your CI CD pipeline. Um, here, the configurability versus the simplicity. Uh, you have way more control of premium app protection uh, and use it. And then you've got various levels of of unsafe environment detection, or instrumentation detection, code obfuscation. Um, again, you have more in the premium map protection. And then there are some other things that, uh, that you can do there, um, including things like white box, white box cryptography for key and data protection um, that, uh, that make that um, a better choice for some of those uh, flagship apps. So uh, kind of rounding, rounding this out and, and summarizing here that, uh, that when you have an app, kind of regardless of what the app is, uh, it's good to layer some kind of protection in it. And again, starting easy and, and, and learning what is actually happening to your app who is attacking it and how they're attacking it and decide what to do that. So having, having these apps that are outside of your normal, you know, perimeter outside of your control to find, you know, to have them protected somewhat and to find out what's going on so that you can decide whether to step up to, uh, to kind of higher level protection than that. And you can do that because you've got um, monitoring turned on. You can get these analytics so that you can look at what's happening to your app kind of the broad population look at look for specific bad actors look for geos maybe where you've got um, where you've got uh, more attacks looking at what kind of attacks are being made um, and this can be uh, looking at these in real time you can have notifications turned on uh, so that you uh, get email alerts when something happens or have this data feed right into your um, your uh, security operations center uh, so that you can uh, combine what you're seeing here with kind of the rest of your security posture and what you're seeing other ways. 
And then because the essential app protection um, is simple, uh, not as configurable as the premium app protection, uh, it's easy to turn it on to fit it into your, your pipeline uh, for building uh, apps uh, so that you can uh, get that security right out of the box and make any decisions about whether or not you need greater levels of security. And without asking any questions in the mid meantime, the information goes pretty quickly. So uh, Jenna, I, we're, we're ready if you've got questions for me. Yeah. Um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them in the, the questions tab in the control panel and we'll get those answered for you. Um, so the first question is, what are the main reasons why so many apps remain unprotected? That's a good question, um, and it's the answer is kind of too bad. Uh, but one of one of the things uh, in terms of why so many apps are unprotected is because um, one of the things we see is software developers don't necessarily take any security classes when they're being trained. Uh, it's usually not required, and those that do, um, it's usually a security more like network security than application security. And so we've got, uh, we've got a bunch of software developers who, who are basically not trained to think about app security this way. Uh, you know, if you go to a standard uh, university program uh, in computer science or computer engineering, um, you spend a lot of time talking about algorithms, you know, and how to, how to make, you know, a, a log n algorithm versus a you know n squared algorithm or whatever, um, so that you can write manageable code, code that's easy to change. Those things all make it easy for attackers. But for the most part, the the idea that the apps that you write are going to come under attack is something that is that is not emphasized. And so we've got a bunch of people who who have not been trained, who don't necessarily understand the threat, and it's only kind of the on the the business side, you know, fraud departments and uh, you know CISOs and and those folks that understand uh, what happens if um, you know if we have a breach because of an app, and so uh, there is. We don't have kind of the education or the mindset in general for the people that are writing the apps. We don't have enough security engineers who are, you know, available to do this. And and frankly, applying uh, protection to apps has been uh, difficult enough that um, that it's been reserved for only kind of the highest value apps. And so, uh, having something like an essential app protection where there's a low price price point, a low barrier to entry. So, you know, easy to, to um, you know, use without any configuration uh, is hopefully going to address uh, the, you know, kind of the, the comprehensive protection uh, necessary, you know, in our, in our current environment. What are some of the, the main pain points between DevOps and security teams? And do you have any advice for overcoming those, those points of friction? Um, so one of, the, one of the problems is you know, the developers um, are trying to get, you know, they're trying to get their apps out the door. Um, and so, uh, they want to go fast. The especially the operation side of of DevOps wants to make sure that those apps are, um, you know, are properly properly um, you know tested before they get out there, and to make sure that uh, the resources that are required, um, you know, are 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 not too great. And so so there's often uh, a little bit of you know, kind of headbutting of go fast, go slow, be more careful. And, and in terms of adding security to the mix, so like DevSecOps, 
um, you know, to figure out um, how to put protection in so that we're not bogging down the developers unnecessarily. We're making the, uh, the operations folks happier uh, because um, the apps are going out the door um, with that security. And so something, something like a simple protection, like I said, essential app protection we've been talking about here, um, can help alleviate some of, the, some of the friction between those groups. Mm -hmm. um, how would you recommend prioritizing which apps to protect first? Okay, um, it's probably more of an art than a science to figure that out, but there are some easy things that you can just do right away. Um, you know, if your app is uh, connected to, uh, you know, medical device, something like that, where where a compromise of the app, you know, can can cause harm to human life, I would say that one is instantly kind of in the in the premium app protection category. Um, if uh there is kind of a, a financial component to it so if compromise to an app gives somebody uh, access to a bank account uh something like that you know that's something where you know it's, it's an obvious choice for an attacker to go there and so uh, kind of a you know that should be uh protected uh first if there's one if there's an app that um that is kind of Providing, you know, a revenue stream for your country or company, um, you know, that's that is one. And then down farther on the list are probably those um, if you've got internal apps or you've got um, uh, a lot of, you know, I know a lot of games that there's kind of a social app component um, that doesn't necessarily um, coordinate with the gameplay, but it's just a way for users to get together. Something like that may be uh, a, a lower, um, you know, kind of lower on the priority list. But again, I mean, I, I said at the beginning, it's more art than science. I mean, those are some kind of pretty cut and dried rules. But then if you look at an app, you may have, um, you may have kind of a simple app that uses some of the same APIs or that still connects to the same authentication as your premium app. And so even though you think of an app as, oh, that's a simple thing and it's not really not doing, uh, you know, anything like, you know, our premium app, because it's using some of those APIs, it may need the same amount of protection. Because again, if, I mean, you could, if you lock your front door, you know, multiple times, you have an alarm on it, but you leave your back door standing open or you leave a window, you know, cracked open, uh, the attacker is not going to, you know, just beat on the front door to try to get through. They'll look for kind of the easiest entry. And if you've got um, an app on an Apple platform and you've got an app on an Android platform and one is protected and it's one, not, one is not, but they're using the same API, the attacker will, will discover that and they'll go for the one that's not protected. Um, if you've got a simple app and a more, you know a more you know kind of premium app and they're using the same apis you know attackers will discover that and they'll go for the one that's, uh, that's not protected so so there are some obvious things and then you know the the lesser things but but i guess in in especially in a low code or no code uh, app scenario you can't just say oh you know the people that did that are you know from you know, this other department, not really developers, they're not doing anything worthwhile in terms of our revenue stream for, you know, for the organization. And so we can leave that one alone. May not be the case. Got it. Well, I don't see any other questions in here, so I think we can start to wrap things up. Um, thank you, Mike, for a great presentation. Again, everyone, that was Mike Woodward, security product owner at digital.ai. I would also like to thank digital.ai for sponsoring today's webinar, as well as the attendees for joining us. Until next time, I'm Jenna Sargent. Thank you.